bringing together voices in child and youth health care. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Manitoba, the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, the Holland Bloorview Children's Rehabilitation Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Saskatchewan, and Trillium Health Partners. We would also like to thank the following Keystone and program partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. If you have any questions or comments for our panelists, please type them into the question box at any time during the presentation. You can also share your thoughts and questions on Twitter by tagging at CAFC Tweets and using the hashtag CAFC Presents. All of our webinars are recorded and can be found on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network. Use the CAN to share these recordings with your colleagues or register an account and post comments, links, or other resources that you think will be of interest. And be sure to sign up for the CAFC Presents weekly email newsletter to stay up to date with upcoming webinars and our recorded webinar archive. All right, hello everyone and welcome to today's episode of CAFC Presents. My name is Doug Maynard and I'm the Associate Director at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. And today we're going to be uh, talking about uh, an introduction to Childbright and how to get involved in their patient-oriented research network. And it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, the folks from Childbright today. We have a fairly large panel, so I'll keep my introduction brief, but um, Childbright is real, it's a real pleasure to bring Childbright as CAFC is a partner in Childbright, and uh, which is really a, a powerhouse, uh, almost a dream team of, of researchers that have come together to really try to uh, to move the dial on, on children's brain uh, uh, research, uh, brain development research. Um, so uh, without any further ado, I'll introduce the, the panel uh, uh, quickly, just a short panel, and we'll hear a little bit more about each of them as they go through their various sections of the panel. But with us today, we have uh, the real the, the leadership group from Childbright to each give us a little bit of an overview of Childbright. And this is going to be the first of what will be many presentations over the next uh, few years over the life of uh, Childbright. Uh, we hope to have two or three uh, uh, presentations at least uh, this year. This being the final episode of our of our season, um, where we'll be uh, uh, wrapping up for the summer for two months. But then we'll be coming back with a couple more uh, sessions. Uh, well, with, with our full season, but at least a couple more from Childbright later on in the fall that you can look forward to. But uh, uh, with us uh, today on our panel, we have uh, Dr. Ed Mainimer. Dr. Annette Mainimer, uh, who is uh, Childbright's network director and uh, and one of the principal investigators. We have uh, Dr. Stephen Miller, who is a co-director with Childbright and, and also one of the principal investigators. We were going to have Dan, uh, Dr. Dan Goldwitz, another one of the Childbright co-directors, but he has been uh, called away and replaced by Pierre Zweiger, who is the training coordinator at Childbright. Uh, we have uh, Frank Gavin, who is uh, the, one of the founders of the Canadian Family Advisory Network, but he's also the chair of the Child Bright Citizen Engagement Council. And finally, we have Dr. Sh uh, Keiko Shikako Thomas, who is uh, also one of the principal investigators with Child Bright. So, uh, without any further ado, it's my pleasure to hand the virtual podium over to Annette, uh, Dr. Annette Mainimer. Over to you. Thanks so much, Deb. So, I'd like to welcome you all to this overview of Child Bright, which is a pan Canadian patient-oriented research network. Uh, um, as many of you may know, last year the Canadian Institute of Health Research funded five SPORE networks that are focused on different chronic diseases. So Childbright is focusing on uh, brain-based developmental disabilities in children. So SPORE, so that's a new concept in CIHR. So what exactly do we mean by, um, by SPORE? And I'm just trying to advance these slides. Okay, so SPORE is the strategy for patient-oriented research, and what we mean by that is that it is a patient-oriented research across a continuum of research. In other words, uh, the research program engages patients as partners right from the beginning or right from the onset and focuses on the patient-identified priorities of research. And uh, the focus on, is on patient outcomes that are of relevance to the patients themselves. So it aims to really address outcomes that matter for patients, prioritized by patients, and they are actively involved as partners in the research program. Um, 
So this is a very important partnership, and for those who are familiar with integrated knowledge translation, this adopts an IKT approach where you have the various stakeholders, so the, not only the knowledge generators or researchers involved, but you also have the knowledge users involved in all aspects of the research program. And this is felt to more effectively improve uh, healthcare practice and the systems. So uh, how did we uh, establish our research agenda in Childbright? So when we, our letter of intent was approved, uh, we had to de develop the full application. So we had uh, various um, brainstorming sessions, and we held two face-to-face -face sessions in Toronto, bringing in stakeholders across the country representing patients, so youth and parents, um, and also clinicians, policymakers, uh, researchers. And we started with one session uh, with 25 individuals and then a follow-up session with 55 individuals to try and determine what were the priority areas for patients at this point in time. And as the themes and potential projects emerged, we then developed an online survey to send out to parents and youths with disabilities to determine if we were really on the right track and to validate whether the themes and projects resonated with them. And we were, fortunately, within a week, we received over 900 responses online, very much uh, confirming the areas that we were, what we were suggesting in terms of pursuing for our research program. So then we assembled teams um, across disciplines, across with different stakeholder groups um, to develop 12 research projects which we'll speak about and the three themes we'll speak about shortly. Um, another requirement for this application was CHR was giving $12.5 million towards this uh, network, but we had to find at least $12.5 million of matching funding from various non-governmental, non-federal funding partners. So that was part of our effort as well. So it's my privilege to introduce Child Bright, which stands for Child Health Initiatives Limiting Disability, Brain Research Improving Growth and Health Trajectories. Um, I'm an occupational therapist um, based at the Research Institute of McGill University Health Center, and, and this is where uh, Child Bright, um, the main office, is, uh, is is held. So I'll just give you a little bit of an introduction to Child Bright. Um, we have three co-directors and there were 15 principal investigators on the application, which included three parents as well as researchers, clinicians, and policymakers. We had a large number of co-applicants across the country, um, all provinces, all stakeholder groups, many uh, collaborating uh, collaborators, uh, different organizations to include CAFSI and 20, 27 funding partners that provided uh, about $14 million of matching funds, uh, which included children's hospitals, uh, foundations, uh, provincial health funding agencies, and then some private uh, uh, companies, uh, 3 to b uh, as an important partner, also some universities. So our vision is to achieve brighter futures for children with developmental disabilities and their families across the life course, so from fetus to uh, transition to young adulthood, by promoting healthy outcomes through optimizing brain development, creating novel interventions, and providing responsive and supportive services. So we will speak about these three themes shortly. Our target population are infants, children, and youth with chronic brain-based developmental disabilities. So these include children with an established diagnosis such as autism, cerebral palsy, attention deficit disorder, specific language impairment, developmental coordination disorder, learning disability, but it also includes children at high risk for brain-based disability. Um, so neonatal intensive care unit graduates, for example. We're also an important target for us are the families of the children with developmental disability. So this is a fairly broad, heterogeneous group of children, um, but together uh, can represent a, approximately 10% of children. So it's, it's a large number of children, but quite heterogeneous. 
In terms of our outcomes, we are, look, we are adopting the triple aim framework, which means that we are interested in child health, looking at child's healthy development, uh, better health care, so looking at the family's experience through the health care system, and looking at better values, so cost-effective strategies in the delivery of health care. So there are four programs within uh, Child Right, and we will now go into each of these programs to describe them to you. In addition to these programs, we also have a data coordinating center based in Edmonton and a health economic service uh, with uh, leads in Alberta and in Ontario. So I'm very uh, pleased. Uh, what I could do is accept that is if there are one or two questions, we could entertain them now, um, and then we'll go on to each uh, area specifically. So I was just wondering if there are any questions about the network. Nope, uh, there, 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 there are no questions at this point, but uh, that's my chance to remind the audience, uh, do, do, please do type those questions in as, uh, as you think of them. Don't feel you need to wait until we break, then we'll have those questions uh, ready to present to, the, to our presenters when, when they pause and, and call for questions. So don't feel you need to wait for questions, just type them in as you think. Okay, so I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Stephen Miller, who is a co-director of Child Right, oversees our research program. And um, he is a, a child neurologist based at the Sick Kids Hospital. So take it away, Stephen. Good morning, everybody. It really is a pleasure to be here. And I want to echo the thanks to CAF C for your engagement with Child Bright. And over the next few minutes, I want to share my excitement for the research projects in the Child Bright Network and really highlight how this is a coast-to-coast -coast initiative. As we look forward to celebrating Canada Day, it really has been a pleasure interacting with researchers from across the country with the common goal of improving the outcomes of children with brain-based developmental disabilities and their families. Our research themes are to develop and test interventions that will improve a child's brain plasticity and ultimately their developmental trajectory. As Annette mentioned, we have a large focus not only on children's well-being, but families' mental health. And then to enhance the patient and family experience within our Canadian healthcare system. Our research projects, 12 of them, are aligned uh, very tightly with this integrated KT program that will ultimately empower children and families for brighter futures. So as we look to the three research themes, theme one, is our theme of bright beginnings. And as we interacted with families in developing the network, there was a group of families, particularly those who were earliest in their journeys with their children, who asked for a focus on a prevention, or can we improve the brain health of our children? And so this theme really focuses on targeting just that. Project one, led by Mike Seed and I at SickKids on maternal oxygen therapy to optimize brain development in the fetus with congenital heart disease. This project focuses on enhancing oxygen delivery to the brain of the fetus with congenital heart disease, ultimately with the goal of improving the developmental trajectories of these children. Project two, led by Ancinis and Prakash Shah, will work with parents of preterm children from across Canada to identify what inter information and interventions are meaningful to them, the parents. Project three, led by Don Mabbitt and Darcy Failings, will test whether the drug metformin, a drug typically used for diabetes, whether this drug will enhance motor skills, thinking skills, and brain repair in children born with cerebral palsy. This is really a, a very exciting project that is taking a bench discovery observation to the clinic. Adam Curtin in project four will test whether non-invasive brain stimulation improves the function in children with motor difficulties from early life and really builds on his very exciting advances reported just over the last year of the potential of brain stimulation as a therapeutic tool. Jan Friedman and Clara Van Carnebeek will test genetic and metabolic abnormalities in children who have motor difficulties that lack of clear etiology or who have atypical cerebral palsy. In their preliminary work, they've identified 
uh, multiple treatable conditions that present with cerebral palsy. Theme two, Bright Supports, is really getting at the priorities that parents came to us with that go beyond the diagnosis of motor issues or uh, dealing with cognition directly to look at those issues of greatest concern to families, pain, behavior, school performance. Project One, led by Hal Seiden and Tim Oberlander, will employ a systematic approach to address pain and irritability of unknown origin in children with brain-based developmental disabilities who have a limited ability to communicate uh, their pain. Project 2.2 Strongest Families Neurodevelopmental Program led by Pat McGraw and Lucy Locke will adapt the Strongest Families Parent Support Program to help parents of children who have emotional and behavioral difficulties related to brain-based developmental disability. Project 4 in this theme, led by Keiko Chicago Thomas, will use the phone application Jue to help connect families and children with brain-based developmental disabilities across recreational activities in communities across Canada. And finally, Jennifer Crosby will test the effect of a highly engaging video game-based intervention on thinking abilities in children with brain-based developmental disabilities. As we turn to Project 3, which is the focus on the healthcare system itself, how can we better uh, design and optimize services by empowering children and families? In Project 3.1, A.L. Cohn and his team will provide a point person to families transitioning from the NICU to their home and ask whether this intervention improves the experience, stress, and health of the families. And I want to point out that this project is co-led by Natalie Major at CHEO and Julia Orkin at SickKids. Project 3.2 led by Annette Mainimer and Maureen O'Donnell, will design a coaching service to parents with children with brain-based developmental disabilities as their children, as their child, transition from preschool to school age. And in Project 3.3, Ready or Not, Ariane Morelli and Jan Willem Gorder and their teams will develop and evaluate an electronic health tool to help teens and families with brain-based developmental disabilities transition from pediatric to adult care to ensure that there is really no gap in their care. So if we look to the road to research, this audience uh, knows all too well all of the steps that are involved with launching research projects. And uh, with my enthusiasm for these projects, there's also a recognition that this is an ambitious program of research. So I want to highlight how the first year has really seen tremendous progress as each of these projects now has a rigorous study design that has undergone a thorough within-network peer review to really drill down to the details of each of the projects. All of the projects have moved on to hiring staff to help with implementation. Led out of Edmonton, we have a robust data coordinating center which is serving as a core and which is interacted with all 12 of the projects. Working with Alan Cooper, who administers the research core at SickKids with me, we are now developing a centralized data safety monitoring board, which will serve as a resource for three of our projects that require a DSMB. You can see on this map that almost all of our projects have passed through REB approval at at least one of the sites, and the remaining four are now have submissions either completed and under review or just about to undergo review. And so our hope is to have patients enrolling in the majority of our research projects by this fall. So the message to you is to get involved. For youth and families, please provide input and or join one of the research projects. And you'll hear, hear more from Frank later on the Citizens Engagement Council. For all of you at CAFC, we're would welcome your participation in our ongoing projects. We would love your feedback to help prioritize future patient-oriented research efforts. And ultimately, while this is a five-year network, our hope is to build the sustainability plan for this program of research, and that will only be done with your engagement. Just as Annette had mentioned, I'd be happy to take a couple of questions before we move on to training. 
We do have um, ju uh, just a couple of questions. The first one that came in was asking, how is wellness and well-being conceptualized to this work? Are there particular descriptions or understandings or frameworks that are guiding that part of the work? That is a, uh, a very important question. There are There is not a uniform approach to wellness within the network, and it varies across the themes. The work that we're now doing with Alan Cooper is, and the Data Coordinating Center is looking to harmonize as many as of the outcomes as possible. The themes have each been meeting regularly with us on uh, regular phone calls where we're looking not only at wellness, but also how does one operationalize thinking, cognition, learning, school performance. And it seems that there's remarkable synergies within the themes. And so your question brings up the key point for us at the leadership level of Child Bright is that the projects have to be more than the sum of the parts. We want to make sure that there's benefit from being a network and that we don't have just 12 independent research projects. And looking at harmonizing outcomes and approaches to measuring these outcomes has been one of those ways where I think the network is providing additional value. For that, and it's really uh, amazing to see the breadth of the of the research projects that you have there. I mean, reflecting certainly the interests of the CAFC continuum of, of our membership from acute care, the premature children in the NICU, all the way to children with disabilities transitioning into adulthood. I mean, it's really, and everything in between, it's really quite impressive to see. But uh, with that, we do have, uh, that, that is all the questions we have for now. So again, to the audience, please do type those questions in as you think of them, and we can move on to our next presenter. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, Pierre Zweigers is here as training coordinator, um, and he'll give us an overview of our patient-oriented training program. Thank you, Ines. Uh, on behalf of Dr. Goldberg, I'm quite excited to introduce our network training strategy uh, with the wider community here today, uh, which ultimately has the goal of engaging both patients and researchers uh, to navigate uh, how to fully implement a patient-oriented uh, research agenda. Um, Childbirth Training Committee consists of uh, various members from different stakeholder groups that include healthcare providers, educators, researchers, and uh, most importantly, patients and family members. Uh, regular meetings from within this group aim to uh, develop the network's overarching training strategy, uh, which ultimately aims to promote um, our, our patient-oriented research agenda in uh, enabling patients and researchers to come together, work on teams, and uh, be actively uh, engaged. Next, Annette. Okay, sorry. Uh, so uh, ultimately, uh, the training core is uh, tasked with providing training opportunities to a variety of stakeholder groups that include healthcare providers and researchers, uh, patients and families, as well as policy and uh, decision makers. Uh, the training opportunities that are designed uh, not only to lay the groundwork for what patient-oriented research is, uh, what it looks like, uh, but how it differentiates from the traditional forms of health research, and also to relate practical strategies uh, as to how uh, one can incorporate patient participa participation more effectively uh, within uh, your research framework. All right, next, Annette. Uh, so our training core has been functioning uh, since August of 2016. Uh, since that time, we have had the opportunity to collaborate with both uh, the BC-based mm -hmm. uh, sports support units uh, and along with other chronic disease networks, most notably, most notably Imagine and uh, Cancel CKD, uh, to roll out CAHR's mm -hmm. foundational patient-oriented research curriculum. Uh, the feedback that was generated during the pilot phase, which concluded uh, just this past March, is currently being used to uh, address some of the concerns that were raised by participants, with the aim being that um, a revamped version will be launching uh, in the fall of, of 2017. Uh, additionally, realizing the need for a more pediatric-focused training agenda, the Training Corps has partnered with KidsCan, a young person's advocacy group based out of the uh, BC Children's Hospital, to design an introduction to health research workshop, which we subsequently used to train a new cohort of engaged youth participants, with the idea being that uh, once they are trained, uh, they will provide some key youth input on uh, the various training, pro uh, the various research projects within, within Childright. And lastly, in our, in our inaugural year, uh, we were also able to launch a summer studentship opportunity whereby we are able to support six undergraduate students 
uh, and, and allowing them to gain practical experience in one of uh, or in, in one of uh, the childbirth projects that are currently uh, active. So where, where are we going to, to next? Uh, over the last year, in us interacting with uh, some various patient groups, not necessarily with uh, our particular stakeholder groups, uh, it has become clear that our training strategies have to be designed in a way that is less restrictive and more accessible to the general project uh, to the general public. Uh, as such, uh, much of our efforts uh, have been focused on developing training modules that would be uh, delivered online um, and as people or have participants complete them at a uh, self-paced sort of uh, capacity. Uh, for the immediate future, uh, we are focusing on launching our online training component for the undergraduate studentship recipients with the end goal of this training program being that uh, they will appreciate the unique perspective that, page, that the patients and families can bring uh, to the conversation when uh, research projects are being designed and, and implemented. And at the same time, we are currently actively partnering with other groups in designing uh, pediatric-focused online training programs uh, that engage with researchers, patients, and families uh, in the basic tenets of, of patient-oriented research and ultimately how uh, providing opportunities for them to learn how to work together and uh, be actively uh, participating. And lastly, focusing on, uh, on our healthcare providers and researchers within our network, we are planning to develop a mentorship framework whereby uh, our senior members act as a resource to help develop core professional competencies in our junior members that will ultimately be beneficial for their continual uh, professional development. So how to get in involved? Uh, we encourage multiple stakeholder groups to connect with the training core to enhance the provided training opportunities that are, that are currently uh, in design or, or, or active. Relevant community organizations uh, interested in raising awareness of patient-oriented research among their members can request us to come and deliver training sessions. Healthcare providers can inform us of any training needs that can fill any identified knowledge gap that they see uh, as being important to fill. Researchers can participate in our mentorship program and help develop capacity uh, in Canada's strategy for patient-oriented research. And most importantly, interested patients and families are encouraged to not only raise awareness of uh, this idea of patient-oriented research, but be a part of the training community to help develop our strategies and address identified needs. Uh, lastly, all stakeholder groups are invited to participate in the training sessions that, that we develop, raise awareness, and uh, most importantly, provide input on unmet training needs. So if there are any uh, follow-up questions, I'll be happy to, uh, to take them now. All right. We do not have any questions at this point. I did want to um, uh, ask. Uh, you, you were taught. You were talking about the hiring. Before we move on, um, there is there. Are you still looking for postgraduate fellow uh, positions to fill? So that was for our. We were just launching. We just finished accepting our final set in the last couple of weeks. So unfortunately, for the summer, um, we we are at capacity. All right. Uh, and there was one other question that came in here about the current training opportunities. How, what opportunities are available for people to take now? So that's what we were currently, we were hoping to launch those online modules by the end of the year or, uh, or early next year. Um, but we are in the summer, we will be hoping to put on another uh, session of CAHR's curriculum for for our stakeholder group, so um, that should be communicated uh, through our website, hopefully, in the next couple of months. All right, thank you very much. And with that, I think we can uh, move on to the next presenter. Yes, and, and again, also, I have to emphasize that um, by becoming a member of, of Child Bright, all these opportunities are uh, sent out to our membership so that you keep as up to date as possible with these new initiatives. So I encourage people to go to the website and become a member of our organization. And when you say become a member, are you uh, referring to subscribing to the newsletter or is there another spot, uh, is it the Get Involved link on the website that people would That's go to? That's correct. So Get Involved where you get the newsletters and that way you're, um, you're kept up to date on any initiatives uh, that are going on. All right. So I'm very pleased to, uh, to welcome Keiko Shikako Thomas. She's an occupational therapist from the School of Physical and Occupational Therapy at McGill University, and she co-leads our Knowledge Translation Program. 
Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, the, so we're here to introduce the, the Knowledge Translation Program within Child Bright, uh, which is uh, led by three uh, co-chairs, uh, myself, Jonathan Weiss uh, from uh, York University, and Connie Puderman is our parent co-lead. Uh, we have Michelle uh, Kanak Marcus, who is uh, our officer and uh, coordinates uh, a lot of the activities we do. And uh, we have a large and extremely uh, good and <laughs> collaborative uh, committee members. Uh, so we have Chantal Camden, Stephanie Clagg, Janet, Mayada Elspach, Noemi Dehan, Ariane, and Ari uh, Gitterman. Natalie, Jennifer, Christine, Joanne, Monica, and Julie, and they do represent people from different stakeholder groups. We have researchers, we have parents, uh, policymakers, uh, different uh, levels, and um, a youth also in our panel. So it's a really great committee, and really uh, the work that we're developing is done uh, in collaboration with the committee. We have two main um, types of activities that we do. So uh, we are going to be promoting and uh, doing some KT events. Uh, so really to establish an infrastructure and evaluative framework for knowledge translation, both within the Child Bright Network and uh, all the research projects that are happening, but uh, to really get uh, events and uh, evaluations done through those events so that we can find better ways to do knowledge translation and to do that in partnership with our stakeholders which takes us to uh, the second part of the KT program, which is uh, improving KT science. So we really um, want to evaluate how we can better engage stakeholders in the research projects and the, in the research continuum and uh, conduct research on the best practices to do integrated knowledge translation and stakeholder engagement, which I'll tell you a bit more about. So we do aim to have a stakeholder engagement, as you saw described in the previous uh, programs and um, how the network was developed on itself. Uh, going beyond you know, the uh, traditional end of grant uh, knowledge translation, where the goal is really to raise awareness about um, research findings once they're concluded, but really trying to move uh, more and more towards this integrated knowledge translation idea where the goal is to engage all the knowledge users and uh, the different stakeholders as partners in the research process. So as you saw, um, uh, as mentioned by Annette, our stakeholders were engaged in setting the priorities. They are engaged within all the research projects, within training opportunities, and as well in the knowledge translation and their core to uh, all the initiatives that we do. And we hope to uh, develop better methods and processes so that they are involved during the data collection, during interpretation, during and generating all different projects, and that we study how we can do that better. So we really want to take advantage of uh, this uh, being a pan-Canadian multi-project patient-oriented program to expand the science of integrated knowledge translation. We uh, want to study the way that the projects are conducted and that the people, you know, patients being parents, youth, uh, policymakers, how they are involved in the different projects and what are the best ways of doing it. And uh, we want to answer to some of the questions like, you know, what are the indicators of integrated knowledge translation success? How do we define it? Uh, how do we measure it on the short and the long term? So how do we know that by doing, uh, by engaging patients, stakeholders, we will have better results now and that those results will be sustained and carried on to system changes and to in the long run. Uh, what do we consider as a, an integrated knowledge translation successes? Uh, what are the tools and constructs that define integrated knowledge translation? And what is the impact of this process to stakeholders as well? So not only for research, but how people that are engaged and participating in this project perceive um, this as beneficial uh, or not. Uh, to do that, we'll be doing that through different uh, products and events. So as uh, Doug mentioned in the beginning, we uh, will be doing a few webinars per year on different themes. And we welcome um, you all in the audience and for people to suggest themes and uh, what could be, uh, what are topics of interest that we could talk about in those webinars uh, as we are still in the developing, the generating uh, data phase but we are hoping to have those results presenting as they are developed through the, the next few years. But we welcome suggestions of themes of interest for, uh, for different groups. 
so feel free to reach out and contact us. We'll be having a KT CAFES with the different projects and the different leads across provinces and in the different uh, uh, initiatives that are being done. And uh, also we'll uh, generate policy briefs uh, to target uh, decision makers at different levels with the research results that are going to be generated. One big event that is coming up and I'll tell you more about is the Knowledge Translation Innovation Incubator. Uh, which will happen in the context of the first um, Child Bright uh, conference that will happen in November in Toronto. So uh, save the date. And uh, we'll, in this innovation incubator, what we really want to do is to learn more and uh, share what, uh, our, what are the perceptions about innovation. What does that mean in the context of knowledge translation and patient engagement? And how we can do that better? How can we create innovation in knowledge translation with uh, the different stakeholder groups engaged? So we'll have participants of the innovation incubator. We'll have the opportunity to generate and expand on innovative knowledge translation project ideas. And that will lead to a funding competition for um, innovation in integrated knowledge translation. Uh, we'll have a webinar also hosted through uh, CASI for more details about the, the innovation incubator itself. So on September, stay tuned for registration details. We'll send uh, information more about that soon. Uh, we also planning to do, and that will be in the next uh, few years, to have uh, to develop a policy hub uh, for childhood disabilities, and uh, that will contribute, I know, in the context of different initiatives that are happening, both at federal and provincial governments, but to better understand what are the policy needs in terms of research, uh, to support the creation of uh, research to policy messages, so how we can contribute to, uh, to create better products and uh, to establish best practices in engaging uh, grassroots organizations and decision makers in the research process and in the research continues, and develop and test evidence to policy interventions. Just want to make a small quick correction out here that Michelle said. So uh, the, the innovation incubator is going to happen on November 6th, not 5th. So save the date for 6th. <laughs> Um, so we really want to hear uh, what you think and uh, what our thoughts are in terms of stakeholder engagement. Uh, we are very open to have people contributing like what are the messages, what stakeholder engagement questions you would like to see answered, uh, from, and that coming from parents, from youth, from um, organizations, from uh, program healthcare managers, everybody who is in the audience, we really want to hear what you think. Also about what populations you think um, that are currently not engaged in research but should be, uh, we can think of you know, people in low socioeconomic status that are often not integrated in our networks or, in, in the, or not in the position to, to participate in those discussions, indigenous populations, women, grassroots organizations, policymakers at different levels, and whatever other groups that you can think of, you would really like to target. Uh, all groups and be as inclusive as possible in reflecting what are the needs and uh, having those needs translated into research. So you can get involved in different ways with the Knowledge Translation Program. Uh, welcome you to attend the Innovation Incubator in Toronto in November and the webinar that will come before in September. Uh, through the Innovation Incubator, be able to submit the Knowledge Translation Project idea. We, you can talk and reach out to all of our committee members. The information is on the website uh, or through Michelle. Uh, the email is there. Uh, feel free to uh, reach out with your ideas, and we, uh, I'll be glad to take any questions on that, on the knowledge translation part. All right. And we do, again, we don't have any questions at this point. I mean, it's such a great sort of overview of everything, but there is so much here that we're just sort of skimming across. That's what's going to be so great about the presentations that are coming up in the fall is we'll be a, a much deeper dive into each of these sections. Um, if people do want to attend the Innovation Incubator, is registration open now or is that, uh, when will they expect the registration to be open? Well, for the conference, registration is open already, so information is on the website. Uh, and so as part of uh, your registration for the conference, which will give you the website in a bit, um, that you, you will be able to just uh, participate in the Innovation Incubator as well. But uh, for participants, like, we really will encourage people to attend the webinar because that's where we'll have more information provided. All right. And the, and the yeah. conference you're talking about is the Brainchild Partners Conference? Uh, that's the title that's of it? One. That's right. All right. I'll have a slide on that at the end, so more, more on that. Okay. 
All right. Well, we can move on uh, to our. I think our. I can't believe how uh, well we're doing on with time with so many presenters on the panel. But I think we are on to uh, our last presenter. So again, a reminder to the audience: if you do have any questions for any of the previous presenters uh, at any point at the end, we're happy to take questions for for the full panel at the end. So please uh, don't hesitate to type those in. Thank you, Doug. So I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Frank Gavin, who is a parent and also the chair of our Citizen Engagement Council and we'll speak about citizen engagement. Thank you, Annette. Uh, thank you, Doug. And I'm hoping um, not to um, be the exception here by not keeping on time. So I'll go through this um, um, efficiently, I hope, but not too fast. So as Annette suggested, um, you know, engaging with uh, children, youth, families uh, uh, is integral to child bright. And, um, uh, I uh, have the honor to be the chair of the Citizen Engagement Council, and one of the things we notice with patient-oriented research is sometimes a confusion about names. In the U.S. and in the U.K., sometimes people talk about public participation, um, citizen participation, and so forth. So CIHR has this overarching term about patients, and that by patients and patient-oriented research, they mean people who have an experience of a health issue and their informal caregivers. So in our, over, our overarching term really is citizen engagement. Um, and, uh, and we want it to be as inclusive as possible. Um, we don't want to be fussy about language, but we do want to sort of use terms that recognize the realities and the complexities of people's situations and roles. So uh, just to note, I mean, we do know that uh, in this, in our world, uh, here we have some people, for example, people with mental health conditions often don't, are not so comfortable with the term patients and prefer p the term people with lived experience. And sometimes people who uh, avail themselves of, of rehabilitation services prefer the term clients. So you know, we want to be sensitive to this and to be, and to be inclusive. And we also know that we have to engage because our children live in the wider world, all the people and all the sectors that have a real bearing on the, the health of children and their families. So we do want to engage, you know, healthcare, social service organizations, educational organizations, and so forth. So, so really there are two things that, are, that I think are important here to look at. One is that, um, you know, we want to be inclusive, uh, and we also want to think about how engagement can be multi-directional. Uh, recently in particular, a lot of patients have been talking about almost what they would, we would call engagement fatigue in the sense that they're always being the objects or the recipients of engagement requests. And increasingly, patients, families, uh, all the people we're talking about here also want to be doing some of the engaging. They want to be initiating engagement. So it's not just researchers engaging patients and families, but it's also patients and families engaging researchers, uh, patients and families engaging policymakers, policymakers engaging patients and families, and so forth. Uh, and it's also, we think of this as being sometimes a very, um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's not a, we want to make sure it's not a sort of a top-down, one-directional process. So recently in Child Bright, for example, you know, we, we, we have heard from a, um, you know, a, uh, through our connections with a, uh, a, an indigenous research, a researcher who's involved with indigenous communities about something that's coming from First Nations communities in southern Ontario, where they're bringing a concern or a need forward. And it's not so much our looking, are you interested in what we're doing? But we've heard from this community about things that are of interest to them. So we're exploring that. So it's a different way of engagement. Uh, in terms of the Citizen Engagement Council, we see here the we have an initial council of 11 members. Uh, four of us are parents. Uh, myself, Donna Thompson, Kate Robson, and Sue Robbins are all parents of children with uh, brain-based conditions. Uh, we have two former pediatric patients, Crystal Chin and Simon Hay. Um, um, we have a, a and many of us, of course, many people wear more than one hat. So Maria Mascui from McGill is a parent and a clinician and a researcher. Uh, we have Tracy Kitch, uh, CEO of IWK in Halifax. Maureen O'Donnell, who's head of, uh, who's a pediatrician and the head of Child Health BC. Doug Maynard, whom nobody needs an introduction to uh, on this call. 
and uh, Annette Maynimer, uh, who's the PI. Uh, what you'll notice there, for example, this is, this is uh, just to go back for a second, perhaps, if we can. Oh, there we are. Um, in terms of there are no current youth, but what we are very conscious of is the importance of engaging, uh, making sure youth voices are included. So we are right now talking about having, for example, a national youth panel, perhaps with the uh, uh, some of the, the, the people um, uh, um, involved with Kids Can, the group in BC. With uh, perhaps we've also been talking with people involved with youth uh, groups at Holland Bloorview, etc. So. We want to be um, to, to make sure that uh, not that they don't just have a, a single member on the Citizen Engagement Council, but that the council is linked uh, to ver various groups. And so, uh, so we met. With, so this is what there are. are it's a wonderful group, and uh, we'll be looking to see uh, how we can be as inclusive as possible. So the next slide, please. And I'll. So in terms of things that we do, I'll just mention a couple of things here. Uh, what, this, what the members of the council do, we've provided a lot of very specific feedback on the content and design of the website. Is it accessible? Is the language clear? Is the content useful? Um, so we've had also a lot of uh, uh, in, we've had a lot of uh, opportunities to suggest things about the conference that's coming up in November in Toronto. Not only the speakers and the topics, but the format of it, so that we, we're having something. Um, where we're going to be hearing the, a, a lot of reciprocal comments, a lot of uh, times where people will, uh, we, have, will, we will have, for example, keynote listeners. So the people will, will be responding from uh, two different things that they're hearing. We've worked, one of the principles of patient-oriented research is around uh, recognizing that, that patient partners, and again, that patient is meant to be a very inclusive term, receive appropriate compensation. So we've worked on what that actually looks like, what we're going to do. So we have formulated these guidelines and we'll be reviewing them in the near future. Uh, we've also are very interested in making sure that that patients and families who are interested, you know, have an opportunity through the, mostly through the website will contact us to make sure that you know whatever in roles they 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 play are roles that are you know appropriate to the ones they're interested in, prepared for. So all kinds of questions here about you know to what extent should their experience with a particular diagnosis matter? Uh, does education, for example, is that a crucial thing? We're looking at, I mean, is it an essential thing? So we're not just looking for credentials or qualifications, but really experiences and skills. Uh, looking for people who maybe, for example, have, you know, live in rural areas and whose experience may be very different. So there are lots and lots of activities that members of the Citizen Engagement Council are, uh, are presently involved in, and we advise all parts of the network uh, and provide guidance. So the next slide uh, there. So some of the things we mentioned here, some roles for patients and parents. These are new roles in many ways. Uh, we did talk, for example, about choosing outcomes. Uh, so outcomes that matter to patients and families. So uh, Stephen mentioned one of the um, research projects about, you know, helping to, to figuring out how to navigate through uh, particular periods of transition, and a question might come up: You know, should that navigator be a healthcare professional, or might that navigator best be a parent who's been through that experience and who's, you know, learned a lot from that? Be a kind of peer navigator. So, these are questions that we ask, uh, and so it's helping to design the research project. Uh, sometimes it means, you know, going back and reviewing the outcomes. Are these really the outcomes that we want to look at? refining the research process. You know, all of us who as parents have uh, endured, I would say, having to fill out surveys and questionnaires when we were, if for example, our children were part of research projects, were subjects of research. And we know sometimes parents are perplexed about questions. Why am I being asked this? What will be done with this answer? Um, and so partly sometimes out of frustration, we may not always have taken the time or you know sometimes we may have been just frustrated with some of these questions so part of our role here is to actually to and say you know to make sure that parents who are participating as uh, in filling out uh, forms responding to questionnaires being interviewed understand why am i being asked this uh, what will be done with this information and i think one of the results will be perhaps better information better results better results uh, next slide please 
So uh, you know, the, the, part of this also will be looking at the results of some of these questionnaires, surveys, interviews, and seeing and, and, hope, and hoping to, along with other people, other researchers, adding our perspective on what do we make of these results that we're getting. Uh, and in terms, in the end, you know, Keiko talked about KT. You know, for, for KT and eventually for advocacy, when the project is, is producing results and findings, I think we'll be better advocates if we are very familiar with, you know, the data, with the results, with the limitations of the study, if we've been involved all along, we will be better able to help uh, with all of this. And finally, uh, I think the, um, the um, uh, last slide, I think, coming up, yes. So just a couple of things, how we know. Uh, one of the most important things is that we always ask the question, both at the Citizen Engagement Council table and at all the tables, you know, who's here and also who's not here? Who should be here? So one of the things we hear a lot with patient-oriented research sometimes is it's important to, to hear the patient voice. And I would always say, you know, there is no such thing as the patient voice. We need to hear voices uh, who will not always be saying the same things, who will not always be emphasizing the same things. So when we're hearing these variety of voices, that'll be a very good thing. Uh, when I mentioned about candor, uh, one of the things that I think is sometimes a sign of progress is when we hear people sometimes saying, well, you know, being able to disagree constructively with one another. Um, patients sometimes disagreeing with researchers, families disagreeing with researchers, researchers disagreeing with families about, you know, here's the, why this is possible, why this may not be possible, and so forth. So I think that's, you know, we're not, we're not in this to disagree. But I think this is in part of our new roles is in, as partners, as equal partners, is to be in a situation where people feel comfortable with difference and sometimes with the disagreement. Um, this whole idea of reciprocity is very important. Um, you know that, um, again, people have an opportunity to initiate uh, ideas, send forth ideas, initiate engagement from all end ends. Respect, obviously, what we're trying to get away there, get away from, is any notion of tokenism, any idea that you know of ticking boxes, of sort of having a single patient representative. And finally, this whole idea of, of I think there is some courage involved in this. It takes courage to sort of do things in a very different way. So sometimes researchers who have been doing research for a long time may not be accustomed to walking around the table and to look be looking at outcomes. Um, with you know two or three new types of faces, new faces at the table, and it takes courage for patients sometimes to ask what might be seen to be a very basic question, but is a, an essential question uh, to speak up and sometimes to, to ask that very important question: why or why not? Uh, so, so it's a new thing, and I think it's very exciting, and I'd be happy to address any questions people have. All right. So thanks again. You know, great presentation. Uh, as, as I said, I mean, it's really an overview of what is a, a massive uh, research sort of network with tons of stuff going on. And we were only able to, well, the purpose of this webinar was to give you just a little little taste of, of, uh, of everything that they're doing with much more depth to come uh, as the research happens and as we have more opportunities to have these webinars and dive a little deeper. Uh, the question that just came in uh, from Ariel is asking, how can researchers approach community members to advise in research without one, overburdening community members or patients with the time, work commitment, but also without, uh, two, relying on the same people and voices all the time while excluding others. Frank, are you open to starting with that? Yeah, I, I, I would say one thing is, is this. Um, you know, when people are brought on board, I mean, it's part of is defining the role. So part of the role of of patients or community members when they come on, I think, is to be looking in two directions. Is to say, you know, um, who else needs to be here? What what opportunities are there to connect with broader communities? To what extent uh, should I be trying to um, to identify others? Um, you know, uh, you know. I think that basic question of asking, you know, who's not here? Uh, uh, and also being also to be able to look at there are different ways of, of contributing and being involved at different levels. And sometimes people see this as a hierarchy. 
but there are people, for example, who um, maybe you know cannot attend meetings, but who can provide feedback electronically. Sometimes it means going to different locations. There are a whole variety of ways uh, of engaging different communities. Um, um, but I think part of it is also is when you if, if if one doesn't have success the first time, it's being persistent. It's going back and saying, okay, can we try a different way of engaging people? Uh, and I think it's also important to find intermediaries, community members who. Uh, you know, are 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 well, um, you know, who are very much part of their communities and who are well well connected. But there is a danger of having the same faces. I think also to be flexible in the approach to see um, those that you're reaching out to to see which ways they are most comfortable with, which times of the day, which locations, which format, Absolutely. use of media. So, for example, to, uh, in, in the research project that we're uh, pursuing, we very much needed families' input on developing a coaching model that really would meet their needs. But having them on teleconferences with um, many researchers talking methodology was very intimidating, yet the one-to-one -one conversations were very rich. So instead of having them as a minority in a discussion with the many researchers, we create a parent panel where they're the majority and it's the researchers coming to them, posing different questions and getting their input and, and they are initiating, they initiate some of the engagement as well as they review materials and express certain concerns or new ideas. And that was a much better framework, you know, not with agendas and minutes, but you know, looking for the formats that work best, um, that really empower their voice. So I think it's, uh, it's this flexibility and um, willingness to try different ways that inevitably uh, will, will result in success. All right, thank you very much for that. Um, the, net, the, the last question that we have here, um, and we do have about two more minutes before we have to wrap up, so we may be able to take one more question after this if there is someone who is uh, quickly typing away in the type, on, their type, uh, on their keyboard. Um, almost a typewriter. That's, uh, um, uh, the question is asking, and they may, be, they may need to put a little more detail. Uh, Roberto is asking the question. He's just asking from, it was just after Keiko's presentation, asking, can you give a little more detail on the funding and scope of the knowledge translation projects? And I'm not sure if, Roberto, if you have anything specific that you could uh, follow up with, and anything specific that you would be looking for, any particular uh, area uh, in knowledge translation or audience that you are hoping they're going to be uh, targeting or what have you. Maybe you can provide us with a little more detail. But Keiko, if you could just give us a little more detail on the funding and scope of the uh, knowledge various knowledge translation products uh, projects that you mentioned, uh, that could we could at least start there. Sure. Uh, so while the current uh, knowledge translation program has like a few uh, projects underway, but I think the funding is about the innovation incubator uh, question. So uh, the idea for that it, it should be on like integrated knowledge translation, and uh, so the the concept of stakeholder engagement, which is central to, to the network. Uh, and uh, the, the, the main characteristic, so in, within integrated KT, uh, we want something that is going to be groundbreaking, innovative, different than what's out there. And that's what, what we uh, will plan to, um, to support with, with this um, coming, upcoming funding opportunity. So I don't know if that responds to in detail, but we will give uh, more information provided in the webinar. But the idea is really to uh, to foster innovation in integrated knowledge translation. So we're working with different stakeholder groups. All right, and, and I'm sure that uh, did answer. We didn't see a follow up, so I'm hopefully uh, hopefully that did answer his question. Yes, he did. Or he did say thank you. That that did answer his question. He looks forward to. We're look, I'm sure we're all looking forward to uh, hearing hearing the more details as we as we go along with this. We did have lots of people, a couple of people at least, uh, that had to sign off right in the last few minutes. That they have signed up for the newsletter. So hopefully you get, did get some uh, a handful of new uh, at least a handful of new uh, people subscribing to your newsletter and, and looking to get more involved as we go. And certainly interest. At, 
pique their interest with the uh, the taste that we've given them of what's, uh, what's to come from Child Brain. So I think we, we are right at 12 o'clock. Again, I'm amazed that we did manage to get the entire panel through all of the uh, presentations. Perhaps, Annette, we'll leave it to you, and, 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 and you can be the gatekeeper as to who else uh, may want to chime in with this. But just anything that you'd like to leave the audience with. I mean, this is not really a, a closing message, but really uh, what message uh, would, you, would you like to leave the audience with as we look forward to future web, uh, Child Bright webinars and, and other information to come from Child Bright? What would you like to leave the audience with as we uh, wrap this up? Yeah, thank you, Doug. So I think, you know, it's really all about engagement. And so we're very interested to hear people's ideas um, and questions. So please contact us either through the website, by email, by telephone, um, so we can continue conversations. Um, we plan to do webinars in the future around different topics, but we're very interested to hear some suggestions of ideas since we have such a great um, network with so much expertise that we can draw from around topics related to brain-based disability that we'd be happy to put together. And I would really just like to invite uh, uh, the attendees to consider attending our first uh, inaugural conference, November 6th to 8th, and this is a, this is a gay, uh, partnership together with Kids Brain Health, which is formerly known as NeuroDevNet. Uh, where we'll have a really exciting program which is now uh, posted online. So I, I really encourage you to, to look at it and to register to our conference. And I very much appreciate all your interest in, in Child Bright. All right, and we did put a couple of links in the chat box, both the uh, link to the Get Involved section of the site as well as a link to the conference, so hopefully uh, people do go and sign up. We did have, uh, uh, and I'm not sure if you wanted to mention, I believe there was an evaluation of some sort that you wanted to mention before we sign off. Oh, thank you so much for reminding me, Doug. So we uh, would like, uh, Cassie will send out to all the attendees and, uh, a survey. Um, just to get some feedback right away from the web webinar and in ways that it was helpful and, and getting some specific uh, comments and suggestions would be terrific. And this is an important part of our uh, knowledge translation evaluation component, so please do take uh, five minutes <laughs> to complete uh, the survey and have that, an initial feedback on that. All right, so we did put that link in the chat box, so you can go ahead and click that at any time and fill out the survey immediately today. Hopefully everyone will do that. Uh, we will also put the link in the reminder email that you will receive in a couple of days as well, so uh, we will try and uh, remind you if you uh, if you haven't had a chance to do it, you will get a, a bit of a reminder uh, in an email in a day or two uh, from, uh, from us, from the webinar uh, uh, system. So uh, please do uh, help us out and, uh, and let them know what you thought of this uh, webinar. All right, and with that, I think we will wrap up. Only a couple minutes over. Uh, as uh, as everyone, most people know, we do our webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Although this, as I mentioned at the beginning, is the last of our sort of, of of the season, we call it. We do take two months off, a little bit of a summer hiatus over July and August. But we will, of course, be back in September. One of the September webinars will be a uh, one of the Child Bright webinars. I believe it'll be on uh, the Innovation Incubator. Um, so it'll be great to uh, see you back there for that one. Uh, when you can watch live, you do. Get get the opportunity to ask your questions and put in your comments, but if you can't, we do uh, put uh, the recordings available on the Knowledge Exchange Network at can.cafc.org, so you can always uh, uh, catch any pieces that you might have missed, or if uh, you do want to share the webinars, uh, the re recordings with anyone, please do. They are free and open to anyone, so please share them as broadly as you would like. So we hope uh, everyone does have a great summer. Thanks again to our Child Bright colleagues for joining us today. Uh, check out some of the, uh, over the summer while we're on hiatus, please don't hesitate to check out some of the previous recordings of the webinars that we've had available on the Ken. We often do send out an email that uh, highlights some of our top webinars, our, our best of over the summer, so uh, we, we may send something like that over the next few weeks as well, just to, to point out what some of the more popular ones were for you. So uh, thanks again to everyone for joining us today, and we hope to see everyone back here in September. Bye, everyone. <laughs>